ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the, the indictment filed by the grand jury against this defendant contains four counts. The first charges him with the crime of robbery in the first degree, the second with the crime of assault in the first degree, the third with the crime of grand larceny in the second degree, and the fourth with the crime of criminally receiving stolen property. I have withdrawn from your consideration the fourth count of the indictment. The robbery is the unlawful taking of personal property from the person or in the presence of another against his will by means of force or violence. To constitute robbery, force or fear must be employed either to obtain or retain possession of the property or to prevent or overcome resistance to the taking. If force be employed merely as means of escape, it does not constitute robbery. When force is employed in either of the foregoing sections of the statute which I have read to you, the degree of force employed is immaterial. An unlawful taking or compulsion, if accomplished by force or fear, in a case specified in the foregoing sections of this article which I have read to you, is robbery in the first degree when committed by a person armed with a dangerous weapon or being aided by an accomplice actually present. In determining whether or not this defendant violated the law, you must be moved by passion or indignation or sympathy for the family of the defendant, nor should you refuse to perform your duty if you believe that this defendant violated the law because a terrible punishment might await him in the event of your finding him guilty. You should be moved solely by the considerations of justice, and when you are called upon to do justice, you must be blind to the individual whom you are trying, and you must not be concerned with whatever fate awaits the defendant in the event that you return a verdict of guilty. The defendant is charged with a serious crime in the first count, but if you believe that the people have established proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant perpetrated the crime of robbery in the first degree, then there should be the uh, fearless action on the part of you gentlemen and ladies, and you should return a verdict regardless of what sentence might be imposed upon the defendant. Neither the learned counsel representing the defendant nor the learned counsel representing the people was on the scene. The opinion of the district attorney, if he expressed any, as to the guilt of the defendant is absolutely immaterial. The opinion of the learned counsel for the defendant as to his belief in the innocence of his client, if he expressed any, is immaterial. You are the exclusive judges of the questions of fact, and upon you devolves the duty and the responsibility of carefully analyzing and scrutinizing the testimony of each and every witness with a view of determining whether a witness is neutral or friendly, or whether the witness told the truth or colored or exaggerated the testimony. What weight and credit you will give to the testimony of a witness rests entirely with you. If you believe that a witness has willfully perverted the truth in any material particular, you are authorized but not bound to disregard the entire testimony of such a witness. You may, in your sound discretion, accept all of the testimony of a witness as true, or reject it all as untrue, or credit it in parts as true, or discredit it in parts as untrue, while you have a comp uh, you have comprehensive powers with respect to the performance of your duty, you should not exercise them capriciously, but your aim should be to do justice between the people and the defendant. Justice does not seek vengeance. Justice aims to ascertain the truth. Justice is the greatest interest which men have on earth because through its medium the minority is protected. The interests of people without regard to race, condition, or limitation are safeguarded. You gentlemen occupy important positions. You are the exclusive judges of all questions of fact. While you sit in this jury box, passing judgment upon the person brought before you to be tried, your power is greater than that of the judge. A judge can deprive no man of his liberty. A judge cannot adjudge a person guilty who is called up before him for trial. That duty devolves upon you. So you should really perceive how important it is to be fair, to be just, 
and to be moved only by a high sense of duty. Now, statements and comments and arguments made by counsel on either side, when sustained by the evidence, should be given careful thought and consideration by you. But statements, comments, and arguments by counsel on either side which are not sustained by the evidence and remarks of a personal nature should be disregarded by you and given no weight or consideration whatsoever. The evidence in this case is of a conflicting character. The people called four principal witnesses. The foundation of the charge laid against this defendant rests upon the testimony of three men Three witnesses told you that this defendant was seen by them in the premises, that he had a gun in his hand, that he was assisted by a confederate who also had a weapon in his hand, and that Brown was deprived of a sum of money. Evidence of identity is one of the most difficult questions which courts and juries are often called upon to deal with. 